Good morning, good morning. It's a magnificent Monday. Hope everybody is nice and rested after their weekend. We are reading the story of Saul and David. Hi, Carrie. Good morning, Jane. Hi, Jana. Just love to see your pretty names come up on the screen. Only thing would be better is if I could see your pretty face. <laughs> There's Lori, my favorite. She's from Lansing. I actually remembered this time, Lori. <laughs> okay. Angel. I've already written down your prayer request, Angel, in my book for us to talk about when we get off of the video. So thank you for that prayer request, Angel. We are definitely, definitely praying for your sister. Okay, we're going to get started. 1 Samuel 22 and 23. And this is, um, <clears throat> I guess, what I want to say this morning because I think this is what God's speaking to me. Slow down and study the relationships that we're seeing. Probably the number one problem we have in life is relationships, not probably. <laughs> the number one problem we have in life is relationships. Finances is right up there uh, in the top three, but relationships. When our relationships aren't good, our life is not good. And we're getting to read to me, probably the greatest story of relationships that I've seen. The only one that even comes close and is by far better than this one is the relationship of Mother Mary and Jesus. That story just continues to speak to me. But there's so much in here. And I shared with you the last few days about how God a, few, a couple of years ago told me to slow down and to study Saul because I'd always just barreled through and I, my focus has always been David, 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 David. And I um, think that that's, I think it was timely for me anyway, that I studied David so much. And then there was a time when I studied Jonathan. And, and then the last couple of years, God has told me Saul. And now today, I just really want to tell y'all to study all three. I've got seven points about David and seven points about Saul that I want to make. But I'm going to jump ahead real quick <clears throat> because it's so relevant to where I'm going today into John chapter 10. So I'm going to skip over the Old Testament reading for just a moment and go to John chapter 10. And by the way, these next six to seven chapters of John, I also want to encourage you to slow down and read through them and let these chapters speak to your heart. And I want to focus on... Um, Verse 3, I guess. Jesus is telling them that he's the shepherd and that we're his sheep. And so in verse 3, John 10, 3, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and they come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So what he's telling us here is, is that he is the shepherd. We are his sheep. He opens the gate for us and we follow him out. But he also tells us that he calls his own sheep by name. <clears throat> and verse 4, after, he, after he's gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. Now, uh, there's so much right here. He walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. Make no mistake about it, you know his voice. You can sit here all day long and you can tell me, I don't know if God speaks to me or not. I, I, you know, I, he probably doesn't speak to me. I, if he speaks to me, I don't know. No, 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 no. This book is true. You do know his voice. He is speaking to you. Now, there may be so much chatter going on in your in your uh, spirit man that you're not able to distinguish the difference right now, but you have the ability to hear his voice and to know the difference. So with that, I wanna go back to my points. Remember that we started with the fact that Jesus goes out ahead of us 
and that we hear his voice. We follow him because we hear his voice. So I want to go to making my points about David and Saul today. So let's first look at, let's first look at Saul, I guess. Um, number one, we're seeing the picture very clearly how Saul worshiped himself. It was all about his self-gratification. It was all about his comfort. It was, it was all about him. Everything was about him. Number two, Saul didn't have a relationship with anybody. In today's reading, he literally threw a spear to kill his son, Jonathan. He didn't have a relationship with anyone because he was too busy in relationship with himself. <clears throat> he served no one. He was more or less forced to be king. Remember, he ran off and hid, hid twice. He didn't want to serve anybody. He, and he didn't serve anybody. He was king to serve himself. Um, and he certainly didn't give. He, he, didn't, he didn't give at all. And then in today's reading, we get to read about the pity party. Um, starting in 1 Samuel 22, verse 8. Is that why you have conspired against me? For not one of you told me when my own son made a solemn pact with the son of Jesse, you're not even sorry for me. I mean, does that not sound like us when we're throwing our little pity party? Oh, woe is me. No one knows the trouble I've had. How come nobody feels sorry for me? <clears throat> and he was uh, always seeking the sympathy of somebody else. He was always wanting um, uh, the attention of somebody else. And that he basically wanted him to feel sorry for him. Um, Pastor Charles says, let it be relationship. It is based on communication. Seek to be sons and daughters of Zion, subject to the Father. Uh, subject to the Father with a purpose of giving God the glory. Saul errs. Saul's error was growing to love profile over purpose. So well put, Pastor Charles. You're so eloquent in your speaking. I just love you to pieces, Pastor Charles. Um, and then number six, uh, he had no loyalty. He wasn't faithful to anybody but himself, and he wasn't really even faithful to himself because he didn't take care of himself. He had no loyalty whatsoever. And then number seven, he absolutely does not know anything about God, let alone because he didn't know him, he's not able to hear his own to hear God's voice. He wasn't even seeking him. I mean, no relationship with God. He doesn't know God at all. And then let's contrast that to David. David, first of all, was forced into exile because Saul was trying to kill him. So I think about Daniel that we read about and how Daniel and all of his family, all of his friends was forced into a foreign country. Um, all of the horrible things that was done to him. Here's David. All David has done is he went into the kingdom. He, he was pulled away from his family. He was pulled away from being a shepherd and, and, and placed inside the kingdom to play the harp for the king and to serve the king. And then, they, and then he made him um, the commander over all of his armies. All David has done is serve. And, and then he was ripped out of that and forced into exile. He was forced into a foreign land with his enemies. The, the people that he knew wanted to kill him um, to live. Number two, he... he um, had to bear the knowledge that the priests were all killed because of him. He knew the priests were defending him. He knew it was because he had had contact with all of the priests that they were all killed, and he had to bear that knowledge. He had to bear the knowledge that not only was he in exile, so was his family. He had to ask permission to bring his mother and his father with him uh, in today's reading. And then number three, he asked God first with literally everything, at least so far up into today's reading, we see today there's three different times that, that he stopped and he said, he said, Lord, should I go and attack them? And so then in verse four, um, this is going to be chapter 23, verse four. So then uh, David asked the Lord again, and again, the Lord replied, go down for I will help you conquer the Philistines. 
And then up in verse 12, again, David asks, will the leaders betray me and my men to Saul? And the Lord replied, yes, they will betray, betray you. I want to come back to that in a minute, but I want to finish my points. So contrasting how Saul never, it never even entered Saul's mind to pray and ask God anything. Uh, and, and even if it did enter his mind, he called for a priest. He had no personal relationship with God whatsoever. And so number five, we see the faithfulness of David. We see the loyalty of David, loyalty to Jonathan. And in today's reading, I highlighted the areas. In today's reading is where we find the pact that was made um, well, yesterday in today's reading, the pact that Jonathan and David made together that then long after Saul and Jonathan were killed in battle, David honored by honoring the offspring of Jonathan. I mean, <laughs> David didn't just stay faithful in the moment. David didn't just stay faithful for the length of a relationship. David stayed faithful his whole life. He was loyal his whole life and um, contrast that to how you are in your relationships. I know God spoke to me about it um, in my relationships. And then <clears throat> he honored his pact. So he was faithful and he was loyal. But when he made a pact, he and Jonathan made a pact that they would be loyal to each other and then Jonathan even made a stipulation that even after I'm gone, you'll be loyal to my family. And, and David honored that. And then number seven, God saved him over and over and over again because of his heart towards God. So I want to end with this today. <clears throat> Back to John chapter 10. But the one who enters the, uh, enters the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. I'm taken back to the story <clears throat> of when David was sure that Saul wanted to kill him and Jonathan said, no, no, my dad loves you. There's no way. And so they made this, this um, agreement to go out into the field and Jonathan would take a... Um, a servant with him and he'd shoot the arrows. And if he told that servant to go even farther for the arrows that David then would know, David would know then that indeed Saul was out to kill him. Uh, and, and if he didn't, if he shot the arrows and just let the servant bring it back to him, he, he would know that David was wrong and that Saul wasn't trying to kill him. And then for some reason, when I read that story this time, then after Jonathan sent the servant back, David stood up and he and Jonathan hugged each other. And this is when it caught me that they were hearing God's voice to even do the story about the, the arrows, to, 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 to do the act of shooting the arrows and sending the servant boy. Because obviously he sent the servant boy home and then David got up and hugged him. So what was the point? Why, why did he even have to do that? And this is what I feel like God spoke to me. And <clears throat> after he has gathered his own flock, I'm back in John chapter 10 again. I'm in verse 9. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him. And we see that, that, that even though there wasn't a scripture that said, Jonathan prayed and said, Lord, how do I show the truth to David? And God says, well, take these arrows and shoot them and say this and say that. We don't see that that took place. And yet, because of the story laid out, we, hindsight's twenty twenty. we get to read the story after the fact. We know and we're able to see spiritually that God was guiding Jonathan and David in everything that they were doing at this point in their lives. That even saying Let's do this. Take your bow and arrow. Shoot the arrow. Send your servant boy to go get it. Are you following what I'm saying? 
Jesus went out ahead of them. Well, who is Jesus? Well, Jesus is the Son of God. Who is the Son of God? Well, he is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's saying that God goes out ahead of us. Are you getting what I'm saying? I mean, I read this, and I and I I I'd read about how they knew to do that and why they did that, even though that it seems to me that there was only three people around: the servant, Jonathan, and David. But they still did what God laid on their heart to do. And then in today's reading, David says. <clears throat> One day, news came to David that the Philistines, this is chapter 23, verse 1 again, stealing grain from the fleshing, threshing floors, and David asked the Lord, should I go and attack them? Yes, go and save them, the Lord told him. That's number one. But David's men said, we're afraid, even here in Judah, we certainly don't want to go out there and fight the whole Philistine army. So David paused. And he prayed again. So David asked the Lord again. And again, the Lord replied, Go down there, for I will help you conquer the Philistines. And then verse 9. But David learned of Saul's plan and told Abiathar, the priest, to bring the uh, ephod and ask the Lord what he should do. Then David prayed, O Lord God of Israel, I have heard that Saul is planning to come and destroy Keilah because I'm here. Will the leaders of Keilah betray me to him? And will Saul actually come as I've heard? Oh, Lord, God of Israel, please tell me. And the Lord said he will come. And then again, David asks, Will the leaders of Keilah betray me and my men to Saul? And the Lord replied, Yes, they will betray, betray you, betray you. And I'm sitting there reading, and I know that I know that God has been telling me for a long time, Elizabeth, I'm saying things to you you're not hearing. They didn't even have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, they had the Holy Spirit come on them. Well, actually, David is the only one that we've read. I've not read that I recall that Jonathan had the Holy Spirit come on him. But certainly Saul did in the beginning. And we saw it subsequent for, to that when the Holy Spirit came back on Saul again and he prophesied with the prophets, remember? Uh, and then David had the Holy Spirit come upon him. But we have the Holy Spirit in us. We've got the oneness. Jesus said, I came because my Father and I are one so that you and I can be one. The good shepherd comes through the gate and you hear his voice and you obey, you follow because you know my voice. And in Old Testament reading, I'm looking at Old Testament saints following to the nth degree, shoot the arrows, say this, say that, do that, do this. Even to the point of clarifying Lord, do you want me to go down and, and will you give me victory? Yes. <clears throat> well, the leaders of Kalar, are they going to betray me to him? Will Saul actually come as I've heard, O Lord God of Israel? Please tell me. And the Lord said, he will come. So David asked more than one question here. He got an answer. How many of us know that if we asked God a couple of questions and we got one answer, we'd be so excited about the one answer I doubt that I'd even remember I'd asked another one, but but see, David's so so comfortable in his relationship that he says, again, David asks, will the leaders betray me and my men? And the Lord replied, yes, they will betray you. Yes, they will betray you. Oh, Lord, to be in such a place to be in such a place. See, hindsight, hindsight, looking, sitting in my prayer closet a few weeks ago when the world is so caught up in fear and panic and unrest, I said, Lord, Lord, how, how come I didn't know? Why didn't I know that this pandemic was coming? How come I didn't hear the word virus? How come I didn't hear danger. 
how come I didn't? And I'm looking up in my prayer closet and at all the things he's spoken to me for the last two years. And, and it came on me. I've said this to you before. It came on me. I looked up and I even looked at what the words for this year was. For this year, 2020. I, I, I drive through town and there's actually churches. There was one church that said, they're out there on their marquee. It said, um, let's uninstall 2020 and install a new one because this one has a virus. This year has a virus. It's cute. I, I know it's cute. It got my attention enough so that I could even almost uh, quote it back to you. But, but the meaning behind it, I mean, everywhere they're saying, oh, we didn't know what 2020 was going to be. So many people thought 2020 means perfect vision. You know what? I think 2020 does mean perfect vision mm -hmm. now. Uh, perfect vision. Perfect vision in that I sat in my prayer closet saying, Lord, how come I didn't know? Why didn't you warn me? And I look up and I look at the things he's spoken to me and I realize he did warn me. I, I can't sit here and tell you that I heard the word virus ever or pandemic or whatever language we're using to describe what's going on today. But I can tell you that in my heart, I know that I know he was speaking and he was speaking much plainer than I heard. How do I know that? <laughs> How can you not know it and listen to the words that we just read? <laughs> Lord, will they betray me to Saul? Yes, they will betray you. Will they conquer me? Will they? No, they'll not conquer you. How, how, much, how much more detail do you need? So for me, just sharing for me, my personal journey, I know that I know that God is showing me with spiritual eyes and spiritual ears that he's speaking on a much more intimate, detailed level than what I've been listening for. Because I'm telling y'all, two years ago, if you'd have told me that God would tell me in advance that in the year 2020 would have a virus, I wouldn't have believed you. I'm, I'm just telling you that I'm, I just wouldn't have. It would have taken a billboard or it would have taken, I don't know what it would have taken. But you know what? Today, I'm so much more sensitive to his voice than I've ever been and today I have a desire to get even more sensitive to his voice than I've ever been. How about you? How about you? Listen and hear. Listen and hear.